may not have ever celebrated the first Advent, but um, what the church has done historically is set apart the four Sundays before Christmas Day. So this year, Christmas Eve is actually the fourth Advent. And so set apart those four Sundays to say, okay, this is a time where we wait and expect and anticipate the Advent, the coming of the King. And so what we're doing at Grace this year for these four weeks is we're going to go through the basic Christmas story. Um, I realized yesterday um, we had a big family outreach in Taizong with uh, a bunch of the special needs families that we work with there. And we got all the kids dressed up and told the Christmas story and just the most basic story. And afterwards, I asked the parents to us, I said, have any of you ever heard the story? And in a group of about 40, 45 people, not a single person had ever just heard the Christmas story, just the story itself. And so we want to do that this month. Of course, in the Taiwanese culture, why would they? And if we haven't told them, why would they know? And so what we're going to do is we're going to go through four Sundays here today. I'll speak on the angels proclaim. Tim will talk about the shepherds tell. You're supposed to sit right here. And then I'll be back again, the wise men worship. And then Joey will finish off that on Christmas Eve in the morning, um, the Christ is born. And so if you want to study, if you want to read um, along with this, um, I have two recommendations for you. And one is if you read through one chapter of the Gospel of Luke every day, you have to read three today because it's already December 3rd, but you'll get right to the end of Luke. You'll get the whole story. But if you want to go a little bit deeper, please read Matthew 1. Um, the second part, the first part is the genealogy, which is absolutely fascinating. Uh, it really is. <laughs> Peter's laughing, but he knows it is too. Um, and then the second part of chapter 1, and then also in Luke chapter 1 and 2. Just the first two parts of, of both of those Gospels. Um, but what I want to do here um, for us too is I want to make sure um, that we all hear and read together the entire Christmas story from Luke chapter 2. And so that'll be the first thing we do together, and then I'll break it down into my part of that story. And I was just uh, meeting with Wayne and, and Ross before praying and saying, um, you know, I don't know how many, I mean, I'm 32 years old now, plus a few. And so, you know, I've heard the story 32 times, plus a few years. Um, and it can be such a story that you, we can just skip over because we know it. And so as we read this story, if you want to just sit and just go back to the first time you've ever heard this, it's an absolutely amazing, incredible story. So let me pray before we start. Father, thank you that you would send your son. It doesn't matter what the actual date was, Lord. We're, we have this month to anticipate and to wait for your coming, to celebrate your coming. And Lord, in all of that, we anticipate and await your coming again all things whole. And I pray that as we are here together, as we read your word, would your Holy Spirit please teach us. There's nothing I can say or do that can change anybody, but your Holy Spirit can. And so I pray that you would help my heart, help my ears to be open to what you have for us today. I pray the same for our brothers and sisters, my brothers and sisters too. Would you please give us a fresh and awe and wonder about this absolutely incredible story of God becoming man. In Jesus' name, amen. Go ahead. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to their hometown to register so Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and the line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there is no guest room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today, today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, 
the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You'll find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God, saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger, when they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. Even if you... Uh, just reread those 20 verses every day or once a week. It doesn't matter. Just reread that and just ask God every time, show me something new. Maybe not in the story, but something new about you um, where I can just get a deeper understanding of who you are and what you're doing. So we want to talk about what God is doing. And again, I, I'm an old history, I'm mean, a young history and geography teacher, so I love genealogies and historical backgrounds and all of this and how this all just kind of fits together. Um, but in the last year and a half, I've always come back or often, often come back to a verse in Genesis 12. And I believe this verse in Genesis 12 is kind of the, the topic sentence. Genesis 1 to 11 is kind of the, 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 the introduction, kind of God setting the stage of what's going on. Genesis 12, kind of a topic sentence. So I want to read both Genesis 3.15 and Genesis 12, 1 to 3 to you today. And we want to look at the Christmas story with these two verses, these two passages in the back of our mind. And so at the very, very beginning, when God created everything, he created everything good. And it was good. And he created man and woman. It was very good. And so man and woman sinned. And that sin caused a chasm, a separation, a rift between man and God for all mankind to follow. And at that moment, when Adam and Eve, we read in Genesis 3, were kicked out of the garden kicked out of that constant presence with God, God at that moment already says, we have a problem and I will fix it. You see, he never says at the beginning, you have a problem, let's figure it out. You figure it out. I'll be ready when you're good enough. No, God says, we have a problem. Sin you choosing to not live the way that I have determined for you to live caused the separation and caused this broken relationship. We have a problem, but I will fix it. And he says, and I will put enmity. This is God speaking to the serpent, speaking to Satan. He says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. And here's the first prophecy of the Savior. He this offspring of the woman, he will crush your head and you will strike his heel. And then in Genesis 12, we'll jump ahead. In Genesis 12, after things get worse and worse and worse and worse between Genesis 3 and Genesis 11 and the flood. And even after the flood, things keep getting worse. And God says to Abraham, he says this, the Lord said to Abram, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. And I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you. That's the first promise. Abraham's descendants will become a great nation, and they will be blessed. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And here's the second promise. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Now, if we read through the book of Romans and Galatians, we don't have all the time we need to actually dissect each of these verses, but this refers here to the people of Israel, because God's plan for the people of Israel was that the good news, the Messiah, would come through the people, through the Jews, to the world. But it also refers to Jesus, the offspring. Jesus is coming as a descendant of Abraham. And so that's kind of the background setting that we want to have for us here as we look at this. And I, I, I want to kind of set the stage here. And I've used the word finally. 
Because for 400 years or so, and we'll get to the 400 years part in just a bit, the people of Israel have been waiting and waiting and waiting for God to just do something. And so in this 400 years, which we often describe as 400 years of silence, all of a sudden, within the span of about three years, we have five angelic appearances, okay? And so we've got total silence for what the people perceived, and now all of a sudden, we have these five different angelic appearances in this three, uh, roughly three, three and a half year time span where God says, I am intervening, I am stepping in, I am communicating so, so clearly what's going to happen next. You see, the angels are messengers. And so the first, first one we have, we have in Luke chapter 1, where an angel appears to Zechariah and says, your wife, Elizabeth, will be pregnant. We then know that later on became um, John the Baptist was born. Um, and then to Mary in Luke 1, an angel appears and says, you will be pregnant. And then to Joseph in Matthew 1, and, and it's helpful. Uh, you know, Matthew 1 and Luke 2, you, you kind of have to overlay them a bit. It's not one story and then a different story. No, you just have to overlay it because the gospel writers had two different focuses in mind, two different um, focus areas in mind that they wanted us to make sure we understand. And so an angel appears to Joseph, Joseph, whoopsie, Joseph, not Joseph, <laughs> that's the German way, sorry. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> it's okay. That's the, the message, it's okay, is important, not if it's Joseph or Joseph. Um, then the shepherds, which we'll talk a little bit about, to, well, that's what we're talking about today, for sure, not just a little bit. And then finally, Joseph, another angel appears to Joseph two years later about when the, the, the kings come to worship, and he says, get out of here, go to Egypt. Got to get out. You've got to get out. And so we have this dramatic increase of God now speaking in a very clear and a very dramatic way after what the people perceived to be 400 years of silence. So Malachi is the last of the small prophets. We call them small prophets not because they were short, but because they didn't write very much. Okay, We should all be called short. Maybe pastors should be short pastors and not preach so long. But since Malachi, the people of Israel have been waiting. Now, we say the people of Israel have been waiting. We've got to go back and look at this historically a little bit here, okay? And so, <laughs> Peter's just grinning. I can't look over this way. He's <laughs> we, we've got to look at this because I want to suggest to you that these 400 years of silence were not God saying, I'm so tired of you, I'm not going to talk to you. You know how we can do that to our spouses sometimes? Or our kids try to do that to us sometimes. I'm just done. I'm not going to talk to you. I don't think that's what's going on here. I think what we have is we have God putting in place what is needed. He could have chosen a different way. Don't ask me why he chose this way. I didn't write the book. Okay, he did. But God put into place four significant empires and situations that would prepare the world for his son, the Messiah, the Christ, the Savior to come. So if you go way back, Israel was split into two kingdoms. In the south, you had Judah. In the north, you had Israel. And so the, Assyri the, 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 Israel, the, the ten tribes of Israel were taken into captivity by the Assyrians. And so what the Assyrians did is they would take people groups and they would actually move them to different parts of their kingdom. And then they would take a group from over here and move them into this part. So actually the Sumerians, you know how the Jewish people in, in Bible in Jesus' time hated the Sumerians? Well, the Sumerians were the people, the Israelites who still lived there, mixed with another people group from somewhere, and then they intermarried. And so they weren't 100% Jewish background. And so they were despised because they weren't pure, okay, in the eyes of them at that time. And so what happened was the ten tribes were actually scattered all over the Assyrian kingdom. And they stayed there. And they're still there. And they've spread even more. But what they did, and this is so interesting, and we'll get to that in, in the point number four. You see, in the Old Testament with Joshua and the judges and the kings, I've been reading through 1 Kings, 2 Kings in my personal devotion, the Israelites were constantly disobedient and turning to idols. We don't have that now. 
The Israelites are not turning to idols as they're in Assyrian captivity and as they're, or, or as they're back here in, 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 in Israel in this part. And what they would do is they would create synagogues all over the world. And these synagogues, I want to suggest to you, is God saying, wait, something's going to happen. Because when the Messiah is born and when the good news of the gospel spreads, there will be pockets of people who understand the Old Testament prophecies. Paul and Peter, where did they go first on all of their missionary travels? They went to the synagogue and they used the Old Testament scriptures to prove to the Jews who worshipped in the synagogues that Jesus was indeed the Messiah, just as it had been prophesied, just as the prophets had said. Okay, so this terrible captivity, the Assyrian captivity, I want to suggest to you, God moved his people into place so that the message of the gospel could spread. The Greek Empire, we have the Assyrians conquered by the Persians, and I won't give you, and then the Greeks. We'll go quickly here, okay? Um, but the Greeks. So what the Greek Empire did was very significant. The Greek Empire and that part of the world actually created a shared culture. And the Romans actually drew a lot from the Greek culture, okay? And Greece and Rome aren't too far apart, but very, very distinct cultures. Um, Europe has many, many very distinct cultures. And a lot of people kind of lump us all in the same bucket, but we're very different from each other. And so with the Greek Empire, they created a shared culture and a shared language. And if you have a common language, then it's much, much easier to communicate. But then also something, as I was studying just historical documents, that sounds so nerdy, as I was studying some historical documents, you know, there's a translation of the Old Testament, or we call the Old Testament, but the Old Hebrew Scriptures that were translated into Greece about 300 to 200 B.C., and it's called the Septuaginta, or the Septuagint, if you say it in English. And the LXX, that's the, the Roman numerals for 70. And so what this also did was that now there was a document available for those who could read, and if they could read, they would be able to read in Greek, of the Old Testament writings and scriptures. So when the Messiah came, you could use the Septuaginta, the Septuagint, and people could read it and say, oh, yeah just as it was foretold, just as it was prophesied. i got to go faster. The Roman Empire, Pax Romana, the peace of the Romans, a relative peace, of course. There's never really a true peace with occupying forces. But the Romans conquered the Greeks, and the Romans then created a, a sense of peace where ideas could spread. And you have Paul, of course, and you know, talking and, and, and Corinth and all these different places, this free exchange of ideas. In Chinese history, this would be very similar to the Tang Dynasty, where arts would flourish, poetry flourished, painting, all of these things, because it takes a relative peace to be able to do all that. And this Pax Romana then allowed for free travel all over the then that central part, the Middle Eastern part, European, North Africa, all the way over into India. And then finally, like I mentioned earlier, the Jews were waiting for the Messiah. They weren't worshiping idols. And this is the whole thing about the Pharisees. They were waiting for God, and so they were trying to get close to God with all the different rules. Well, we followed all the rules. Let's do even more rules, and still not good enough, so let's do even more. And they're waiting, and God's not saying anything. And so we have this anticipation and this expectation of waiting for the Messiah. All of this reminds me of one really, really important principle. God wants all people to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. God didn't only want the Israelites to be saved. That's what they thought. But God wanted all people to be saved. So he puts this in place that when the Christ is born, when the Savior is born the message can go out to all the people. The angels proclaim. That's my topic today. Sorry, that was my introduction. When, don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. When, what, and why, and to whom, I feel like I'm writing an English, a, a English paper in middle school again, right? When, what, why, who, what, when, where, why, whatever. Uh, to, not whatever. To whom, um, Tim's going to talk about that next week, so I'm just barely going to touch on that. But we want to look at this here. And, and one more finally that I think is so hard for me to learn and to understand in my own personal life. 
You see, it says this in Galatians 4, 4, and 5. This is such an important verse. And when we worry about God and we're praying, and God, why are you so slow? And we don't dare say it, but we say it anyway. Then we feel bad for saying it. And then the Bible says God's not slow as men understand him to be slow. See, God has a plan. And the plan will come into place when the time is right. And if you read your Bible, sometimes pay attention to the phrase, at that right time, or when the time was right. That, that phrase, or when the fullness of time had come, or, or, or that type of phrasing. God has a plan, and God's not in a hurry. I'm in a hurry. God's not in a hurry. And it says this in Galatians 4, 4 to 5, but when the set time had fully come. Jesus did not come too late, and Jesus did not come too early. Jesus came when God had set the time for him to come. And so when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive adoption to sonship. Of course, you all remember that teaching from a few months ago. Let's go to our passage here. An angel of the Lord, so we have the, let me, i got to recreate the scene here, okay. And I don't have costumes. I did this with costumes yesterday with like 15 special needs kids and wheelchairs and all of this. It's kind of hard to move them around. But they got the story. The angel of the Lord appeared to the shepherds who were outside in Bethlehem and they were watching the flocks. And the interesting thing is, and I just learned this a, a, a short while ago, that a lot of times the flocks that were watched, that were kept, that were raised outside of Bethlehem, very often were the ones that were actually meant to be used for sacrifices in the temple. Isn't that interesting? So they were watching the flocks that were most likely going to be the ones that would be used to sacrifice in the temple. And that's an amazing image there of Jesus being that Passover lamb. But that's not the point of today. The angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. The glory of the Lord here, and this word Shekinah glory, the word Shekinah is actually not used in the Bible, but it's a word that Jewish historians and Jewish scholars have used to describe this idea of the glory of God, the glory of the Lord. And so when you see this glory of the Lord, you, this phrase used, this would describe a, 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 a supernatural way when the invisible God becomes visible. Now, this is really significant in the story. And this guy, German Fuchtenbaum, German theologian Fuchtenbaum, um, has this definition, which I thought was the best definition. When the invisible God becomes visible, and the glory of the Lord shone all around them, and they were terrified. You see, several hundred years before this, Ezekiel had a vision. And the glory of the Lord departed from over the threshold of the temple and stopped above the cherubim. Now, in the Old Testament, the tabernacle, the dwelling place, symbolized where God was dwelling with his people. God was with his people in, so to say, the tabernacle. Of course, God wasn't limited to the physical space of the tabernacle, but that's something that the people could understand. When the temple was built, the presence of the, the glory of the Lord moved into the temple. That was something that people could understand. Yes, God was everywhere because he's God, but that was something they could understand. The glory of the Lord is in the temple. And what happened here, because the Israelites were so disobedient, the glory of the Lord departed from the temple. And so some Bible scholars disagree. When Ezra rebuilt the temple, did the glory of the Lord return to the temple? And from what I've read, most say no, it did not. And so we also have the Shekinah glory, the visible God, the invisible God becoming invisible, not appearing for four, five hundred, six hundred years. And now the invisible God becomes visible again. See, that's the depth of the angels appearing to the shepherds. The message too, yes, but the Shekinah glory, the glory of God is appearing to mankind again. John 1, 14, it goes even further. It gets even better. The word became flesh. The invisible God not only becomes visible, he becomes flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory. What are they talking about? That Jesus was like super buff and no, 
They knew it was Shekinah glory. The glory of God became flesh, lived for a while among us. Where am I? We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. And then, jump back to Isaiah, because this is prophesied. And we have to understand the significance of this word. Not Emmanuel, God's always with me, I can feel good and I can be happy and I don't have to worry. That too, yes. But even richer, the glory of God, the Shekinah glory, is actually here. Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us us. Today, the temple is what? It's me and you if we're Christians. And who lives in us? The Holy Spirit. So we have this God with us as who we are, not a place we go to, but who we are. So this is the first message. (laughs) Okay, what do they proclaim? There are shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night, but the angel of the Lord said to them. Oh, I think that's in the wrong part there. Anyway, let's skip that first sentence. I must have cut and pasted that in the wrong place. But the angel of the Lord said to them, do not be afraid. Can you go back? I don't, because I don't think I can go back from here, because I missed this one part here. And they were terrified. In the Bible, over and over and over again, when an angel appears, the people are terrified. The natural response to the presence of God in the Old Testament was terror because they couldn't handle God and the glory of God. We have to understand that. So they were terrified because it wasn't just an angel, it was God, the glory of God that they saw there. Let's go, oh, oh I can go forward. <laughs> Sorry about the first sentence, but the angel said to them, don't be afraid. And they say that often after we get afraid. You know, Joseph was afraid. Mary was afraid. They were afraid. Everybody was afraid. The first thing they say is, don't worry. Don't be afraid. I have good news for you. And this good news will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You'll find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. And I want to take this apart a little bit, Okay. And so you know that the the Hebrew word Messiah and the Greek word the Christ, that means the Savior, the one who saves, okay? And so in different translations, it's kind of used differently, and you may have memorized some of this before, but when you see Christ and we see Messiah, it's the same word that's being used here. And so the angels say to them, the first thing is, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of the glory and the presence of God. Now, they're not so much saying, don't be afraid about what you're going to eat tomorrow or about the wolves that want to tear into your sheep. I think that, too, that's an application that we can draw from this, too. But that's not the point of what's going on here. Don't be afraid. That's the first one. Second one is, I have good news for you. And this is the Greek word, evangelium. Okay? You've heard evangelize is to share the good news. Okay? In English, we don't have that as a noun so much. In, In some of in German we do, but not in English. And so this idea, I have, we have good news for you. And this good news, whatever this good news is, will cause great joy. See, that's pretty significant. Because in the waiting, and in the longing, and in the waiting some more, some of you have waited for something for a long time. And you can actually, in the waiting, lose your joy. It's not hard. You start getting lonely. You start losing your joy. You start isolating all these things. And see, this is good news. Because this good news will cause great joy for all the people. Now, the word the here is significant. I don't want to spend too much time on the word the. But some of the Bible scholars actually say that this is referring specifically to the Jewish people. Not all people, but all the people. Because again, remember Genesis 12, the blessing will go through Israel, through the Jews, to the rest of the world. And the Israelites thought, no, it's to us and we'll keep it away from the rest of the world. Okay, the good news, they wanted to keep it to themselves, which we as, (laughs) sorry, we as churches do the same thing, right? We're not so keen about going out there and telling others about the good news because it feels pretty good right here where we are too, okay? So that's the one thing where we got to be really careful we don't fall into keeping the good news to ourselves too because it's our 
It's our commission, it's our command to take the good news out there. Today, so this will cause good news. Here's what it is. Today in the town of David, again, referring to a prophecy that was made hundreds of years before, in Bethlehem the Messiah will be born. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Christ, the Lord. Actually, it's there. It's the Kyrios Christos together, the Christ Lord together. Okay? So not only is he your Savior, he's also your King. Not only is he going to save you from what they thought were the Romans, but he's also going to rule over you. Okay, and so that's really important. This is the Kyrios Christos, the Christ King that has been born to you. This will be a sign to you when you go to Bethlehem. Probably many babies wrapped in cloths, but not many lying in a manger. And then here is the ending to this. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host. That word company there refers, is often used in an idea of a massive, massive army. In this case, a massive army of peace proclaimers. Company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace on those on whom his favor rests. The result is peace, and the result is joy. And we have to remember that. The result of this good news is peace and is joy. We can't end the story here, though, because we have to ask the question, why? Uh, two or three years ago, I was talking again to some uh, Taiwanese parents in Taitung, and uh, I had shared, and maybe I've told the story before here, so forgive me if I have. And uh, I had gone through kind of an overview of the Bible in Chinese, and I was so proud of myself because I didn't stumble through it as badly as I thought I would. So I'm telling the story about, you know, um, here's the situation, and Jesus was born, and this, and this, and this. I'm kind of laying it all out there, and I patted myself kind of in the back thinking, oh, yeah, that was pretty good. And then one of them, and they were taking notes, right, which makes, always makes somebody feel good when someone's like, you don't have to pull your phone out now. But, but they're taking notes on this. I'm thinking, they've never heard any of this before. And then one of the moms raises her hand, and she asks me a question. And it totally deflated me, of course, right? Whenever we think we've done a really good job, just that one key question. And she said, but why did Jesus have to come and die? And so in my story, I missed the whole point. I had a great story about Jesus and love and coming. And she said, but why? Why did he have to come? And see, as we go through this basic Christmas story, we have to answer that question. We're going to answer it first when we go back because the angel actually tells Joseph. Here's what he says to Joseph. After he had considered this, leaving, his, leaving Mary because they weren't married yet, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife because she was what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus. The one who saves, Joshua, same name, because he will really love you. Yeah? Because he'll make your life work out if you do everything right. Mm, no, not really. Mine hasn't worked out that way yet. Because he will save his people from their sins. You see, this is why we have to go all the way back to Genesis 3 again. When Adam and Eve sinned, it caused that separation between God and man. And God says, there's a problem, and I'll fix it. Because the separation is the sin. And so Joseph was told, you're going to call his name Jesus or Joshua, because he's the one who's going to save his people from their sins. That's why Jesus came. To save us from our sins. I'm going to end here because we're about to sing this song, right, Joey? Yes. So good. I was like, oh, no. Hope he didn't change it. <laughs> this is from Hark the Herald Angels Sing. And I'm not putting the old hymns on par with the Bible. Don't. I'm not doing that. But that poetry is so amazing. 
And that poetry that we read in the old hymns, forget about the music. Sometimes that, this song isn't, but some of that old stuff can be so slow and you don't get why it's so slow. But the poetry is unbelievably rich in its theology. And we just have these two verses because as you sing this song, as we sing this song together, would you please not just skip over these lines? Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king, peace on earth and mercy mild, God and sinners reconciled. In Chinese, the word reconciled is he hao, right? To put together towards peace again. Well, you can't reconcile something that wasn't a part. You don't need to he hao something if it's always been hao, right? So there has to be together a separation and then a he hao again, a reconciliation again. See, and that's the story in Genesis 1, 2, and 3. God made everything, and it was perfect, and Adam and Eve were with God in the garden, and then sin separated and created a need for reconciliation. And that's what the angel told Joseph. He will reconcile. He will save his people. He will bring together people and God again. Peace on earth and mercy mild, God and sinners reconciled. Joyful all you nations rise, join the triumph in the skies. With angelic hosts proclaim, Christ is born in Bethlehem. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king. You guys can actually come on up. I'm just going to read this last verse. If you want to come up for this. Then this verse. So, so rich, the poetry here. Hail the heaven-born prince of peace. Hail the son of righteousness. Light and life. To all he brings, risen with healing in his wings. Mild he lays his glory by. Why? Born that man no more may die. Born to raise the sons of earth. Born to give them second birth. Hark the herald angels sing. Glory to the newborn king. Born that man no more may die. You see, that's the thing. If we're not reconciled to God, we will die and be separated from him forever. And Jesus says, no. That's what God said at the very, very beginning. Your problem, you have a problem, but I'll fix it. I'll send my son who will save my people from their sins and will reconcile us again. Born that man no more may die. Born to raise the sons of earth, born to give them second birth. Father, thank you so much for this story, that this, this historical account that you've put in Luke chapter 2 of how the angels proclaimed and demonstrated how your glory was now again on this earth and how this message of this completion of what you had promised thousands and thousands and thousands of years before that you would bridge the gap, that you would fix the problem, that you would take it on you to do the work necessary to reconcile us back to you, to reconcile me back to you. And Lord, I'm, I'm so grateful to you for that. And Lord, as we celebrate Christmas, as we do all the fun and good stuff, Lord, help us to remember that you came to reconcile us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor Ruba. Uh, let us worship and sing this hymn together. There is a, um, a, a, a modern part of the song that has been added, and uh, we can also do that part.
second birth and born that we no more may die. We have an eternal glory and an eternal life with you. Thank you for giving us that honor and we can be in relationship with you. We want to give you all the honor and praise. Help us to remember, remember you. 
that we may have life. You came to give us life and life abundantly. We thank you in the mighty name of Jesus. May your blessing be upon your people in the mighty in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Have a blessed Sunday, everyone. Cheers. We'll be right over here as soon as Eric dismisses you. He's the boss. <laughs> and then we're going to let sound people move this stuff before we barge in and pull out Christmas trees, okay? Because there's a way to, I just unplug it and hope for the best. But we're going to let sound people do that. Yeah.